You're listening to a message presented at New Market Christian Church. We're located at 300 South 3rd Street in New Market, Indiana. We meet for Sunday school at 9 o'clock and for worship at 10 o'clock each Sunday morning. If you do not have a church home, we'd love to invite you to join us here at New Market Christian Church. And now, a message by Dr. Gary Snowden. I titled simply Family Responsibilities. <laughs> we all have them. I don't know what yours is. Fortunately, since I moved here, I mow the grass, but my wife takes out the trash. It's like a mile to the trash. Not quite, but, but uh, around there. But she takes the trash over there. We, we all have our different jobs and families that, that we do. If somebody's coming over, she'll say, if you clean the bathrooms, I'll clean everything else. I say, well, that sounds like a deal. <laughs> uh, two little rooms compared to the whole house. I don't know what the deal is with that bathroom thing, but, but we all kind of have our jobs, don't we? Things that we don't mind doing and things that uh, uh, we would really rather not do. Well, we're going to talk about family responsibilities this morning, and we're going to be looking at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 9 to 11. It's not those kind of responsibilities. It goes more to the spiritual side of things this morning. While we do have those kind of family responsibilities, I think inside the family of God, we have responsibilities as well. Sometimes we don't really focus on those like we ought to. Let's take a moment to read what it says there in this morning's text. It says, Do not repay evil for evil, or revile for reviling, but, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. I think we better stop right there. Last week we learned from verse number 8, right before the series of verses we read, that we are family. And I asked you to find a family member last week to help out. Remember I said look around the church family, find somebody they can help out. How many of you actually did that? Like, you don't have to raise your hand, just shake your head so I know that somebody did it. Or maybe you better raise your hands. I can't, I can't tell if they're nodding. How many of you tried that? You thought somebody helped? Okay, now I feel better. I want to make sure that the, the messages are actually hitting home. If they're not prompting us to do anything, they probably aren't doing any good. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that we found some way to actually help someone inside the family of God because helping inside the family of God is very important. Our biological family, well, that's important. We learned that this week. We were at the hospital all day yesterday. Uh, different hospitals, but we went to see her mom. She had a metal plate put in her, in her foot and a couple pins because she fell and, and broke her ankle. So we spent some time there taking care of our biological family, going to see her mom and, and doing the things that needed to be done there because biological families are important. But so is our spiritual family. Our family is important, and we are part of what's known as the family of God. I think sometimes we miss the importance of, of family, and I love what one really famous man said about his biological family. He was a fighter pilot. That's the picture. Very distinguished career, flying in a, in, a, in a jet to protect America. But he was also a United States congressman. On top of that, he was head of the CIA. Sounds like a pretty smart dude, doesn't it? He was ambassador to the United Nations. He was chief liaison officer in China. Figure out who that is up there in the picture yet? You know, any idea? Well, you'll know soon. He was chairman of the Republican National Committee and eventually vice president of the United States of America. Wait, I'm not done yet. He was vice president. There's another slide. He was also the president of the United States of America. Serving as vice president and president. Both. And yet when his public office ended. When all the glory days were over and done. He said I still possess the most important titles that have ever been mine. I am a husband. I am a father. And I am a grandfather. 
he considered being a husband, being a father, and being a grandfather more important than being the president of the United States of America. Friends, we are family. And family is very, very important. As family, we have responsibilities. Inside the family of God, we have responsibilities. We want to examine some of those family responsibilities this morning. And I want to do that starting by looking at verse number 9 again. And kind of reading through it and stopping where we want to focus. It says there, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Would you pray with me? Dear God, as we get started this morning, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be in your house. Dear Lord, I realize that I'm but a clay pot. And I ask that you will fill me with your spirit and that you will use this clay pot to do your will, to overflow with your word, dear Lord, and to share your truth so that people can understand them. Be with us throughout this service. Open hearts and minds. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. You know, we learned firstly this morning there in that verse that we need to be a blessing to others. We need to be a blessing to others. If you've got that handout sheet inside your bulletin and following along, that's the first point there. We need to be a blessing to others. In any relationship, there's going to be times of disagreement. There's just no way around it. Conflict is inevitable in life. As we learned last week in our message, conflict can be very painful. It can be so challenging to figure out how to get through. And during those times of conflict, we face a choice. We can retaliate, seeking revenge, or we can respond with a blessing. That's our choice. We can retaliate, seeking revenge, or we can respond with a blessing. Conflict is like a little fire. Just a little fire burning out there, and this small fire has two buckets sitting right next to it. One bucket is filled with gasoline. The other is filled with water. And the bucket that we choose to throw on the fire makes a huge difference in that fire's ability to destroy. In real life, our buckets are filled with words. The gasoline bucket, well, it contains words of hostility. It contains words of anger. It contains abusive words. It contains hurtful words. And in real life, the water bucket, well, it contains words as well. Words of acceptance. Words of forgiveness. Words of kindness. Words that point out value of those around us. Now what the world says? The world says, you get your revenge. The world says... Pick up that bucket of gasoline and throw it on the fire and watch it burn. That's what the world says. But as believers, we should be picking up that bucket of water. Because when you throw that bucket of water on the fire, the fire goes out. It's a choice. We've got to make a choice. Are we going to make the conflict bigger? Or are we going to do our best to put the conflict out? When we give someone a blessing, we cut that person some slack. We bless them. We cut them some slack. We overlook some minor faults. But sometimes we're called upon to overlook some major faults. I tell you, it can be challenging. We understand that everyone has a bad day from time to time. And we can get past that. But some people are just plain cantankerous. They're a lot harder to deal with. There's times when we need to dish out way more kindness than the people receiving really deserve. But that's part of being the family of God. Our goal as we do these things, as we pour the water on the fire, as we try to bring things to a conclusion that is good and peaceful, our goal is to protect our family. We want the family of God to be unified. And that means we've got to be willing to forgive as God has forgiven us. When we do, God pours out blessings upon us. 
In fact, if you continue reading there in verse 9, less, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. You want to obtain a blessing, then be willing to bless others. Well, that leads us down to verse number 10 this morning. There in verse number 10, we read these words. For whoever desires to love and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Now, I read that thing, and that just sounds so simple. But it isn't. It's a real challenge. In this verse, we're being told literally, if you, if you, if you boil it all in a nutshell, we're being told to control our tongues. You ever tried to do that? I've read the book of James. James makes it clear that complete control of the tongue is beyond our human pay grade. It's just a reality. We, we're never going to get complete control of it, but that doesn't give us a license to use our tongues as weapons. But I think sometimes we have a tendency to do that. We want to throw the gasoline rather than the water. We've got to show some wisdom as we communicate with others. We need to control our tongues. Wisdom, it's not something that comes naturally. It's got to be sought. Proverbs 31 makes that clear. Tongue control is not naturally occurring. It's not a naturally occurring phenomenon. You've got to really work at controlling your tongue, and it requires a whole lot of wisdom. But here's the thing. Getting older doesn't necessarily make you wiser. It's just a reality. Getting older doesn't necessarily make you wiser. There's a huge difference between aging and maturing. Some people never really grow up at all. There's only one thing you've got to do to get old. <laughs> Avoid dying young. <laughs> and that's it, isn't it? That's all you got to do to get old, just avoid dying young. Sometimes that in and of itself can be a real challenge. I'll tell you about one of those challenges in my life. I was in high school. Had a friend by the name of Brett Meadows. He is now a, one of the EMT instructors for the state of Indiana, one of the head ones for the state. When we were kids, he was the, kind of the rich guy in town. When we were in high school, his dad, his dad bought him a Camaro with positive track rear end. And he would sit out there in the parking lot and spin those tires till smoke was blown and rubber was laid. And he just had a car that was really cool and everybody knew it. But I had me an old Ford Galaxy 400 four barrel. That was a beater. My dad owned the junkyard, so pretty much what I drove was all beaters. It's whatever was out there. They were putting a new road in over by Hagerstown, Indiana. It's called State Road 1. <laughs> you know how they... They tear up the road, they, they dig up the dirt, there's piles of dirt here, there's piles of dirt there, they've got the big things up where you're not supposed to go through. Well, I had that old beater car, and I had Brent Meadows in the car with me that night. And I thought, I'm about to get his coat. I, I, I had a whole junkyard full of cars. <laughs> I was good, we could fix things. So I took that old Ford Galaxy, and we went on that dirt road where they'd been working, past the signs, and we're flying down that road going north on one. And we come up to a side road, and they've got it blocked off too. There's a, there is a, uh, you know those, those uh, orange and white signs that they don't want you to go around? There's that, and there's a, a tree over here. And I think there's just about enough space for me to get through there. So I step on the gas, and I'm fishtailing, and I head right up through there. And we whoosh, through that thing, and we don't touch a thing. We come out the other side. And Brent Meadows, who's always talking about how great he is and how he's never, you know, he's got the best of everything, he said, I'm never riding with you again. You're crazy. <laughs> so I had a great day. It's a wonder I lived. If you think back to the things you've done, you've probably done things like that. When you look at them, you wonder, how am I still alive? The only thing you got to do to get old is not die young, but sometimes our intelligence makes that a real challenge. If we manage to stay alive, time will take care of the aging process. But the goal of believers is much greater than just merely getting older. Believers should seek to mature as they travel through life. And the question that we need to ask this morning is, how do we know if we are truly maturing? How do we tell? I think one of the marks of spiritual maturity 
is an increased ability to control our tongues. I think that's a good mark of spiritual maturity. An increased ability to control our tongues. The ability to watch our words. The fact is, God's measure of maturity is based on our Christ-like love for one another. Are we loving one another like we should? Are we treating one another like we should? Peter is saying that the way to diffuse conflict is to exhibit a Christ-like love to others. To control our verbal reactions to whatever is going on so that we are throwing water on the fire rather than gasoline. We demonstrate our personal maturity when we exhibit Christ-like love even in difficult circumstances. But if we fail to control our tongues, we're going to show a lack of Christ-like love. And in the process, I believe we'll harm the relationships of those that we'd like to love and that we'd like to have love us. We need to ask ourselves, are our tongues exhibiting a Christ-likeness? Or do our tongues lack maturity? A maturity is really, a, a lack of maturity is really a lack of Christ-like love, isn't it? Do we say things about people behind their back that we wouldn't say to them face to face? Do we? If we do, maybe we haven't matured to the point we need to be. Do we pour out rumor and innuendo like buckets of gasoline? If we do, we have to question, are we really mature? Do we take some kind of sick joy in spreading gossip? If we do, maybe we need to mature just a bit more. Do we bone up the phone lines? You know what I mean by burn up the phone lines? You're calling everybody up and telling them what's going on. Do we burn up the phone lines about someone rather than seeking ways to help them when they're facing challenges in life? If we do, we probably got some maturing to do. Do we make mountains out of molehills by adding a bit of our own dirt? If we do, we've probably got some maturing to do because these kind of actions are destructive to the family of God. They breed anger. They breed division. And they should not be a part of the family of God. Family responsibilities continue there in verse number 11. It says, let him turn away from evil and do good. See it there? Turn away from evil and do good. The first part of this verse teaches us that we must turn away from evil and do good. We should never seek to promote that which is evil in the sight of God. In fact, Scripture tells us we should never call that which is evil good or that which is good evil. We've got to keep focused on what is good, what is right, what is responsible. But the text didn't stop there. He says you've got to make sure that you are doing good. I think we have a real tendency to talk about good. Sometimes committees drive me nuts. Sometimes board meetings drive me nuts. Because we talk about things, and we talk about things, and we talk about things, and then we talk about things that we talked about, and then we talk about those things that we talked about some more, and we don't get anything done. If all you do is talk about good, you're not accomplishing anything. You've got to get out there, roll up the sleeves, and make the good things happen. When others are, are striving to tear someone down, we need to find ways to build them up. Let me give you an example. Let's say someone seems to be a little less kept than the average Joe. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, I see some heads tonight. Someone's just a little less kept than the common Joe. Their clothing's old, it's worn out, it's unmatched, possibly not as clean as you're used to. There's a choice to be made. We can join in the crowd and poke fun at them, or we can choose to do good. We've got a choice to make. We can talk with the person. Maybe they didn't know any better. Maybe they just need some instruction on how to fix their hair or do their paint job or whatever they're doing, you know? They just might need some help with that. Or maybe they're longing to do better, but they simply can't afford to do so. And then maybe doing good means taking that person on a shopping trip and helping them get some better clothes. As believers, our goal isn't to promote evil. It is to promote good. And that brings us to our final truth this morning there in verse number 11. It says, Let him turn away from evil and do good, 
Let him seek peace and pursue it. This verse tells us <laughs> you need to be chasing after peace for all you're worth. That means we need to be trying to get along with one another. We need to become peacemakers, if you will. And the job of a peacemaker is to resolve conflict, right? You want to make peace, we've got to resolve conflict. If you're starting fights all over the place, throwing gasoline on little fires to make them flame up, you're not a peacemaker. God wants us to pursue peace with a passion. And that means that we need to seek reconciliation whenever possible. I guess that means, in terms you can understand, we will sometimes need to disagree agreeably. We may not be able to come to the same conclusion, but even when we disagree, we love one another. Even when we disagree, we go out hand in hand and we go out willing to be friends and be family. We understand that being family is more important than being right. It's a challenge sometimes. It's not a mandate to throw out truth now. Don't get me wrong, that's not what I'm saying. It's not a mandate just to throw out truth. It's a mandate to share truth, now get this, in love. There's a big difference between sharing truth and sharing truth in love. trying to think of a good example. I didn't have one written down. This may not be any good, but I'm going to give it a shot. If I walk up close to you and I've been out working in the yard, and my underarms are just a little stronger than they ought to be, you can say, Man, you stink! Or you could say, Looks like you've been working hard today. There's a difference, isn't there? Saying something in love and saying something hateful. It, there is a difference. And God has already shown us what it looks like to love somebody, to reconcile with somebody, even in difficult circumstances. God took the initiative to bring sinners to himself, to reconcile us when we had come to a point where we had irreconcilable differences called sin. He was a peacemaker. He showed us what reestablishing a broken relationship should look like. It requires extending forgiveness even when forgiveness is not deserved. Is that not what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary? He extended forgiveness even when forgiveness was not deserved. We need to forgive. We need to love. We need to reconcile. We need to be peacemakers, not heartbreakers. We don't want to break the heart of God and we don't want to break the hearts of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Hearts and relationships are far, far too important. The fact is, if we run around breaking the heart of God and if we run around breaking the heart of our fellow men, eventually our own hearts will be broken. Eventually our own hearts will break. So here's what I want us to do this week. Here's the action plan. Here's what I want us to do this week. Can you get, I'll give you one guess what I want you to do this week from the picture on the screen. What is it? Oh, you got it. Bite your tongue. I want us this week to bite our proverbial tongues. When everything inside of us wants to throw out a snide remark or innuendo, let's bite our tongues. Now, not literally. Not literally. I don't want to have to come to the car and visit you while they're showing your tongue back on. I don't mean take this literally. But figuratively, I want us to bite our tongues. Let's take some time to think before we talk. Let's bite our proverbial tongues long enough to come up with something kind to say. Let's throw water rather than gasoline on the fires of conflict. Now we can do this if we will start blessing people who have stirred up our dander rather than trying to hurt them. I think we might all be amazed at the difference this one simple act can make in our relationships if we will put out the effort to do it. The fact is, as children of God, it's our family responsibility. We're going to be singing about these very things in our hymn of commitment this morning. I want you to sing this hymn, but I want you to listen to the words 
And I want you to really mean it. Say to God, God, I'm willing to go wherever you want me to go, dear Lord. I am willing to do whatever you want me to do. I'm willing to say whatever you want me to say, dear Lord. Just give me the strength to do it. Won't you stand and sing with us today? You've been listening to a message presented by Dr. Gary Snowden, minister at New Market Christian Church. We would love to have you come join us as we seek to worship God, love one another, and reach out to our neighbors.